The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode three of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, and I'm coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, my guest is Ben Hilziger, a good friend of mine. I've known him for years. He is the drummer in Eve 6. He's also artist relations for Big Fat Snare Drum, and he is the host of the Big Fat Five Podcast. The Big Fat Five Podcast is also part of the network that we are part of, the Drum Click. So please, if you haven't yet, go to thedrumclick.com. Check out Ben's show, The Big Fat Five. You can see the archives of our show, Drum Candy. And you've also got Drum History Podcast and Sarah Higgins Backstage. Those are the four shows on the network at the moment. Ben was instrumental in creating that network and invited us to join. Uh, so we talk a little bit about that. We talk about, of course, this whole season's about snare drums, in particular, my first snare drums. Also, it, later in the episode, I explore some of Mike Johnston's suggestions for upgrading this gig snare drum. Um, I ran some issues that I'll discuss later. I think I want to revisit um, this week's drum tech segment again next week just to give it a fair shot. But uh, anyway, let's get to the show. So before we get too deep into that, let's uh, let's hang with Ben Hilziger. You're in California. Hey, what's up, Ben? How you doing? Welcome to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Yes, I'm in blistery California. Yeah, it's a little, a little you smoggy are a here. You quarter note, a quarter note, and a triplet partial delayed. That's our delay time here. You know what? I'm just trying to throw you there. off any way I can. So, <laughs> so how's it feel to be interviewed for a podcast and not the interviewer of a podcast? So much less stressful, man. I got no worries right now. Oh yeah, I mean, because before you, I mean, like on my show, I have to like make sure like this conversation conversation keeps moving. Now I'm just like, hey, if this sucks, it's on you. <laughs> no, it's on you. You're the guest, dude. Don't mess with this. Is, this is my mindset going into this. So this is what I have to be. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone listening, I'm sure you're aware, but if you're not, Ben is the host of its uh, Big Fat Five podcast on our network here. Um, he is also, what is technically your title for with Big Fat Snare Drum? <laughs> That's a good question. The other dude? Uh... <laughs> the other dude, part of a dynamic duo, Ben and Chris from Big Fat Snare Drum. Um, and also the drummer in the band Eve Six, mm -hmm. a busy dude. I'm glad you could take some time to chat here. Um, yeah, so, man. what is a typical day for Ben Hilsinger? Um, let's see. I wake up. I go for a run because that's the only way to have sanity these days. Uh, I do yoga, and because uh, I live in the hills California. of Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, I have long hair, a beard, <laughs> tattoos. I do yoga in the hills every morning. And uh, yeah, I mean, usually it's, well, with, with Big Fat Snare Drum, it's just a part-time gig because it was kind of meant to be this supplemental thing between tours with Eve Six. Met Chris yeah. way back in the day, and I was a fan of the company before I became, uh, you know, working with him. And uh, yeah, so it was kind of like, if you need any help, let me know. And he's like, well, how about this many hours a week at this? And I was like, cool. Um, and so it's really only probably it's part-time work. So that's probably midday, but most mm -hmm. of it is just, uh, yeah, spent working on the podcast and I'm not sure how long it takes you to edit these, but I, uh, it's, having a pre-recorded podcast is, uh, is a lot more intricate than I thought it was going to be because I, I, mm. I tend to go on tangents a lot. Maybe you don't edit as much as I do, but I edit I a don't. good quarter of what I say out. No, I tend to, to let the warts be warts and lean into them. I think it's, I mean, yeah, if you say, there's been a few, I mean, a few times over the years where like, whoa, we should not have said that and it has to come out. But <laughs> yeah, in general, I think awkward pauses are kind of important in some ways. So mm. I tend to leave them in. But yeah. I don't know. This is a whole new show for me. So I'm probably going to be chopping it up like crazy and back into being super neurotic like I was in the beginning of podcasting. But you've done a lot of episodes. Why are you yeah. still it's, freaking out about it? Well, I'm not freaking out about it. It's just like I hate pops and times oh, where yeah. like the breath doesn't line up. So if it's like, you know, I've, I've had some guests like probably I'm doing right now that kind of stammer and kind of meander on points and I'll like kind of clean it up so they look more concise. But <laughs> it's like it's like the crossfading and that kind of stuff. It's not so much trying to make the conversation oh, right. better. It's just I don't want to it to sound bad. But um, so, yeah, I mean, me and Chris are doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. So it's a lot of just uh, logistical stuff. And we're the 
the whole pandemic had us pivot in a lot of ways. So um, a lot of it mm-hmm. spent that way, but I've been totally redoing my entire approach to drumming and, and style. It actually started with my James Gadsden interview and mm. I, I was trying to play, you know, play along to his stuff. And it totally just got me back into Motown and like Muscle Shoals soul music and like the, um, you know, Roger Hawkins kind of, kind of drumming style. And so the whole pandemic, I would say <laughs> many hours a day are me in this door right behind you, um, getting rid of all my Eve six, uh, instincts and technique and trying to have everything lower, smaller shells, just play softer and try and channel those kind of drummers. But, uh, yeah, most of my days spent in front of a computer uh, or on the drums. <laughs> so, so aren't you guys like gearing up to play some shows? Aren't you going to be in a totally different mindset? Yeah, no, wise? I'm screwing. I'm, I'm not doing it well. Okay, I'm not setting myself up for success. <laughs> if that's what you're implying, uh, no. I mean, I wish that I've talked to people about it. Like, I wish you could have that Emma, that Men in Black little little I don't know clicker yeah. where yeah, you're yeah, like you erase it all. I wish yeah. I could just erase you know uh, my instincts because no matter what I do my impulse is always to play like Eve six, but, uh, yeah. it's just, as I get older, I want to be in that band that's, you know, plays theaters. And if I have to play a shaker for three songs in a row, I'll be stoked mm-hmm. as long as the song is good. You know, I was but, just talking. So there's a, there's a artist in DC that I've been playing with for probably close to 20 years at this point. And every year we probably play 20 shows or more. And we haven't played a show in two years. And he mm-hmm. called me last night. He's like, Hey, I have a, possibility to do three nights in a row do you think we can do this yeah. <laughs> like literally do you think physically we can do this <laughs> oh my god dude i so eve six just did a live stream and we played 13 songs and dude i haven't played consistently for 45 minutes since i mean this is kind of morbid but the last the last eve six show i remember it so vividly because it's on the flight back Kobe Bryant died. My lead singer turned around. He's like, hey, Kobe just died. Mm. So that wow. was January of 2020, which seems like 5,000 years ago. But that was the last time we played a show. And so, yeah, just mm. physically, I was just like, you know, having like chest pain. And so you know, I was like, what is this? I'm not used to this stuff, you know? And that was 45 minutes in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, that was that was on the, uh, the walk-in. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm worried about just my hands blowing up because I, I mean I've been practicing and playing, but nothing like a live show. Like that's the big concern for me is there, my thumbs are just gonna blow out. <laughs> yeah, well, it was funny for us. Like it was the best. I mean, if someone's seen the live stream, maybe you have a different perspective. But we actually sounded really good, and we're like, we should never practice because we we didn't practice for the live stream. Maybe I didn't say that. We literally walked in and we're like, well, let's just play a few of the songs, and a few of the songs were the take that we used for the live stream. Um, maybe I'm uh. giving away our secret that it wasn't really live, but most of the mm. songs were done one take and we're like, I guess that's fine. <laughs> it's very different <laughs> than how I do the podcast. They are so just like, that was good enough. Move on. Don't even, you know, listen back. So, I mean, how long you've been, that has to be like riding a bike for you guys at this point. It's been a few years. Yeah. Like, none, regular st- we, touring. Though the, the the songs that did take two or three takes were the two two of the songs off our new EP that we had literally mm-hmm. never played before. Um, so, but <laughs> sadly enough, it's it's the song Black Nova and Can We Combine, which are within five BPMs of each other and the exact same chord progression for the verses. So it was like we were like, oh wow, way to go, guys! <laughs> the two songs we choose are like the same song. So how do you approach a song like that, those two songs, to make your parts signature or different? Do you do anything specific or does it all become instinct? Well, it's, they hate Phil's. <laughs> they, okay. So it's really hard to, yeah, they... they Sorry, Phil. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they hate Phil's uh, and, and John, the, the guitarist, hates crash cymbals going back into verses. So uh, with, with Eve 6... Um, full disclosure, I'm not the I'm not the original drummer, and so they're sitting there with a bunch of gold records on their shelves, and I have opinions, mm-hmm. and those op- mm-hmm. <laughs> there's a little bit of a hierarchy there, and so how I how I uh, you know insert my personality is to play a fill and then see if they look at me, and if they don't, then that means I can keep the fill, but uh, with with Black Nova, the only honestly deviation from the Billy Jean beat I did was a four and a 
on a on the on the snare every other turnaround in the chorus. So um, I actually find it fun to play a whole song and see how many fills can I not do because that's harder mm -hmm. for me because uh, I grew up with just you know Southern California punk rock ska music and so it's just like how many fills can you fit in in, yeah. in between the singer singing. And so with them, it's all about restraint. So um, I'd say with, with Eve Six Live is where they give me a lot more leeway, you know? It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, but on the record, it's it's very, I don't want to say dumbed down, but it's very just like Black Rebel rebel Motorcycle Club, just just you yeah. know, just drive it, which I think sounds, that sounds cool. Did you record it during this COVID? Well, so we recorded the EP actually in, in December and January of 2019, 2020, and we were going to okay. release it back last April and do like a whole eight week tour. But uh, the good thing about us having to cancel and push back the release is that now we're on Velocity Records. They, they picked up the EP. Um, and so that the, the EP is actually, you know, 13 months old, but mm. uh, I actually just recorded a full length, uh, full length worth of drums the same weekend uh, as as the live stream. So uh, the EP comes out in June and then we'll just be releasing new songs probably like every month for the rest of the year. And then the, the full length will come out probably soon. So we have a lot of music. Um, yeah. That's great. So is there touring already in the works? We had some um, that we were gonna announce, but then uh, you know the, the stuff wasn't aligning, but we have we have a bunch of fly dates this summer. Uh, mm -hmm. we've, we've had a bunch of fly dates and they were canceled because sponsors, you know, pulled out, but, uh, we're, we're talking about doing some headlining shows in the fall and then kind of, uh, really going back into full swing to kind of replace that eight week tour at the beginning of next year. But, uh, nice. who knows? I imagine there's going to be some different protocols, right? I've heard like there's talks of, of apps, like, <laughs> like, um, that will that let you know if someone tested positive near you, like. There's all sorts of stuff coming out that's supposed to benefit touring artists. Yeah, I, I guess mean, we haven't got to that point of discussion yet, but I've heard murmurs of like everyone's going to have to pass a test before they can even walk in a venue. Yeah, like vaccine cards. You know, I know there's like some yeah. some ethical. You know, because some people with autoimmune disease can't get the vaccine, so it's like, but then do you even want to be going? I mean, should someone like that even be going to concerts anyway? And. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I was curious too, cause we were going to announce, uh, a tour in the, in, in, the, in the summertime and I was thinking like, okay, so with a merch person, um, are they going to be, cause we're probably not going to be doing meet and greets. That's obvious. Uh, maybe it's not obvious, but we were probably going to not do that. Mm. And it's like, is, is it going to be a merch person that, I mean, that's a few grand every night if you don't do merch and yeah. are they going to be coming back on the bus after, you know, handling money with like hundreds of people, you know, it's like logistically i don't i don't know what's going to happen but you know i'm vaccinated or vaccinated so hopefully <laughs> i'll be a guinea pig mm. maybe <laughs> did you get your second shot or did you do the one and done dude i got that, my second shot on friday and i was and on my butt on saturday dude which one did you get pfizer ah that's what i'm in for so it's yeah. not a good not a good day after well going back to me working out in the mornings i did leg day on I sound so douchey right now, dude. But I did leg day <laughs> on Friday morning, and so by Saturday, I, I'm this, I'm a lanky tall dude, and so even if I like do leg day twice a week, it'll still just be sore the day after. And so I had my lower body was just like screw you, and then my top body was like, well, we like what they're doing, so also screw you. And uh, I never got nauseous or anything. I was just tired and achy. And so okay, I'm not you're I'm not sure if you're the same way, but as an adult. As long as I know I'm not going to die, I'll take a sick day any day and be like guilt-free sitting on the couch doing nothing because I don't do that enough. <laughs> I can't, man. I can't. I think I have restless leg syndrome for real. Yeah. Like the last couple of nights, like my knee has been twitching. Like either I have a torn ligament or I've got restless leg syndrome or something. Well, you're, you're a tall dude too, right? Yeah, about 6'2 on a yeah. good day. Okay. <laughs> it's yeah. enough. It's yeah. enough to, to wreak havoc. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So wow, what a I was, conversation. So <laughs> yeah. Jeez, <laughs> yeah. guys. So you guys haven't heard enough about the pandemic. So there's that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, it's, 
I haven't. It's funny because at the beginning of all this, I was made sure to keep in contact with everyone regularly and see how they're doing. And everyone was kind of sussing it out and figuring out what they were going to do for money. And But then like the past year, it's like everyone was just kind of like coasting. I feel like, like, okay, everyone's cool. Now where are we at? I don't really know. Yeah. You know, everything's starting to open back up. You know, I've got like a clinic on the books in August. I'm like, should I do that or should I cancel that? I don't I don't yeah. know. I'm still kind of in the weird, but I feel like it's on the up and up. I got news that Broadway's going to be opening up in September. Oh, that's awesome, which is a dude. lot a lot earlier than I think anyone expected. So that's promising. Um, so whatever. Is it going to be at we like to, a third capacity or? I don't, I didn't hear anything about that. I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be checking vaccination cards. I think <laughs> I'm going to have like a weird stratus in society where the the unvaccinated have to live in the sewers i don't know but <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> yeah i'm at the point where when people say they they don't they aren't going to get vaccinated i'm like i i don't even want to start with you right now i don't i mean no, i'm not judging I, it's also kind of like i just don't want to have this conversation you know there's enough information out there that you've made your choice okay i guess yeah yeah i, I try and steer away from that Anyway, Ben, what was your first snare drum? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so I, yeah, I, I took this two different ways. So my first snare drum that I had that was kind of like, quote unquote, you know, no one else was playing it besides me was actually my dad's drum set. And so it was, the, okay. it, it was the snare drum that came with the drum set and it was a Ruther and R-E-U-T-H-E-R. Uh, okay. They're made in the 60s and 70s. It was eggshell white, and now it's very yellow. My dad still has it, and uh, so yeah, it was it was a pearl stencil kit essentially. It was made in the pearl factory. Um, I'm sure there'll be some fact checkers, but I'm pretty sure. And and yeah, it was a it was a six and a half by 14 steel Ruther snare, mm. and uh, it's it had four beads. They weren't as thick as like a superphonic bead, but it was four, four beads on it, and uh, yeah. I played a lot of in sync songs on that snare drum, because that was my, <laughs> <laughs> that was the record that, you know, it's just Max Martin just boo, cat boo boo, cat boo boo, so I was like, oh, I can play that, <laughs> that CD with with the blue flames on it. I don't know what you're talking about. I was a grown adult by that See, time. See, Mike, then. before we started recording, you, we were talking about NSYNC for like 30 minutes, and so I know you're lying. <laughs> I thought you said uh, Blink-182. <laughs> well, the, that came later. That was when I wanted the poo-poo pee-pee jokes. But when it was, when, you know, oh, technically it was Americana by The Offspring was the first record I bought. But uh, some of those, you know, drum beats were a little too fast for Baby Benny, so... Insane. So did you like that snare drum or was it just the drum you had? You know what? It was before I really, well, I would say 99% of the time when that snare drum was played, it was in my parents' basement or kind of like the lower level of the house. It wasn't the basement, it was like the rec room. And it had those foam, like the foam sound off things on it. Oh, them. yeah. So yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember if I even remember what that snare sounded like. It sounded like goo, goo uh, from my memory. <laughs> But uh, I mean, that was. Oh, you back... mean the ones that cover the whole head, or the, like the Remo, like ring things? No, like the, the ones the that foam... like, yeah, like the half inch thick foam things oh, where you yeah, you so can't it don't do like it. anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it was the original big fat snare drum, essentially. Uh... <laughs> When's that model coming out? Exa yeah, exactly. We'll <laughs> just sue them. We, we 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 have the patent. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was that. But I would say, if I'm being honest. The first snare that I bought with my own money that was like, this is my snare drum was a six and a half by 14 uh, Black Beauty. Um, a Dang, key, Keystone you went badge. All in. Well, I mean, God, I was old enough by that at that point because I had someone gifted me this pork pie pig light acrylic 13 by 7 thing that was kind of a side. I never it was like my main snare, but um, yeah, my Black Beauty. And actually, I was, I was, uh, Introduced to LA pretty quickly because the, the like the second week I moved to LA, uh, it got stolen out of the back of my car. <laughs> but this is a disclaimer for anyone: get renter's insurance because when your car gets broken into, your car insurance does not cover stuff in your car, but your renter's insurance does. And so they actually gave me retail value for it. But I already had, I think I had an Acrylite, I had a Superphonic, and so I was like, well, I'm not going to rebuy 
a black beauty. So I ended up getting some 15 inch uh, 30th anniversary agop hi hats for like 600 <laughs> something dollars that I would have never bought if the insurance company didn't give me this check. So um, whenever I am playing my agop symbols, I always think of my black beauty. Oh, that's like heartbreaking and kind of cool. But why didn't you get a new one? I well, mean, it's just because I, I don't know. I always, I'm a curmudgeon on like, I think it's because everyone loves the Black Beauty. I'm like, pff, I always EQ out of this, you know, the the part that people like about brass anyways, like an asshole, um, which is probably not true. But I just, I, I got my, 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 my 400 dialed in so well. And I was I like, mean, yeah, I have $800. That's... Do I want to get another beaded metal shell snare of the same, you know? Yeah, smart. So smart. I got the you agop. And, yeah. You chose wisely. I would just have been like, no, that was my one drum for all gigs forever, for eternity. Her name was Cadence, but. by the way. I always name my drums. <laughs> and uh, that what was... What is the Supra? <laughs> um, I think, oh, you know what? You're actually calling me out. I don't have a name for my Supra. But but the um I know but the um but the orange acrylic's name was Saint Diego because my buddy was from San Diego <laughs> and it just it sounded <laughs> very regal so its name is Saint Diego and I still have that one. So, what is the first thing you do when you get a new drum or you're like showing up to like rental gear to kind of get comfortable with it? Oh my gosh! And you can't say throw a big fat snare drum on it. Yeah, 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 you can't yeah. say it. <laughs> um yeah i mean I, I this might be a dumb answer but i i just i just i just tune it real real quickly you know um i usually crank it if it's a snare i crank it to see how it sounds if it's really really cranked um and then i'll bring it back down to a normal not get fired from the gig level but uh mm. yeah i usually just uh overtune it and uh well if i'm being honest the first thing i do is play a six stroke roll if it's a snare drum if i'm sitting behind there any kind go. of back line i just go da -da -da -da. okay <laughs> or i do the little um kick kick floor tom snare drum but -da -da. hey that's a good sound and snap this room sounds good you know <laughs> and then i usually never touch the rack tom because i can never make that thing sound good anyways um, yeah. and then I usually detune the floor tom, like one lug completely just to, just the duh, cause I know the sound guy is going to be, Hey, there's something wonky going on with that. So I just get that out of the way. Um, but yeah, I usually crank the snare and then sweet pea from Eve six goes, no, Ben, I tell you every damn time, we're not letting you play the snare drum that high. And I go, okay, mom. Where does it end up being? A medium, medium tight, you know, with, uh, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does medium tight mean? Like, what is the note? Are you like, I think a medium tight is being just below the choking point. So you're here in the shell, but it's not like, like super. Multi. Yeah, I guess it's more of a feeling, you know, I know I'm okay. not as, as, as much of a gearhead. It's, it's, it's really as, uh, I just kind of go off, off kind of, uh, yeah, feel. Um, and, uh, I usually travel with a big fast nerd round sound. So it's just enough to where you can still get a little bit of that, that crack, but you're not getting that, that crazy overtone. Um, but if, if I which had Which model is that? Can you explain which model that is? That's the thin ring, two inch ring. Yeah. It's, it's our response to like the Richie O ring, you know, it's just the inch, inch, uh, inch thick, uh, mylar. Inch. Um, that is basically just the white mylar of the big fat snare drum cut into essentially an overtone ring with the thumb mm -hmm. cut out. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's really just, uh, a feeling thing. You know, if I can do a quick six stroke roll and if, if the ghost notes feel good, you know, and then of course I have to, uh, you know, make it sound good for the room. Cause sometimes the rooms just sound like they have crazy overtones. So there you go. Yeah. So what, I mean, you mentioned that model, what other models of, I don't even want you to like plug your own product, but I'm very curious, what other big fat snare drum products do you carry with you? I use Steve's donut on an entire tour. Sure. And I didn't, I only had to tune the drum once when we were in Little Rock and the room just had a certain overtone that was feeding back the mic. And that was three weeks into the tour. Yeah. Like that thing just worked and made that drum just sound good. Well, the thing about, big fat snare drum is that I, I want people to know that like, we don't expect people to use it on every video. I mean, it's, it's for a, it's for mm -hmm. a vibe, you know? And so with, with big fat snare drum, 
when you think of Eve Six uh, and what I think about Eve Six and try and honor the legacy of, of Tony, the original drummer, is is that late '90s cranked pop sound. So. Um, mm -hmm. I'll use I'll use the 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 Steve's donut, which is the six inch hole cut out um, of it's, it's like the original, but with the six inch holes, so you still get the attack of the of the real batter head. I'll use that on like the ballads, you know, like here's to the night, and maybe think twice. But for the most part, the round sound still lets the, lets the uh, let let the drum lets the drum sing, which is what mm -hmm. you know. So if people see me on the videos, they're like, why aren't you covered in big fat snare drum? It's like, dude, not every song requires the rumors <laughs> snare drum head, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I like to have a, a, a donut XL, which is basically a Steve's donut with a bigger hole. Um, so you're, you're, most of the head is actually exposed. I put that in the floor, Tom, um, just so I can have, you know, the I don't have to detune the drum so much to get that thud. So you still get the response of the stick, but then the sound guy's happy that he's not getting some, some warble. Because a lot of mm -hmm. times, all these these backline kits. I mean, ninety percent of the time that I'm playing with Eve Six, it's not on my own drum set. So you have mm -hmm. ten minutes to like uh, do this six stroke real cool, and then you gotta you know <laughs> make that and your these A customs that are all cracked. You gotta make them work. So. <laughs> <laughs> so when you hear a snare drum in your head, is there a like a record that you reference or a certain drummer sound? Yeah. Um, I really like uh, the snare, and it's funny because it's kind of all over the place in that record. But uh, um, "Deja and Tendu" by Brand New, it's uh, okay. It came, I don't know it. It's, uh, I mean, they kind of made. It's funny. I don't really listen to that record that much today, but I would say that a lot of what Taking Back Sunday tries to do was introduced by Brand New. It's kind of mm. emo acoustic with some screaming, but it's still melodic. But that record especially is very. Uh, what's what's the I'm gonna I'm gonna sound so not cool right now, um, but it's it's the pic, the Pixies record with the Where Is My Mind. Well, basically, it's mm -hmm. this, the drum sound on that that record. Do -ga do -ga da boo boo ka boo. It's like really okay. huge drums, but with an acoustic underneath. Um, that's kind of the sound of that brand new record. So a really compressed Is cymbal that Steve sound. Steve Albini? Did he do it? Um. For the brand new record? I don't know why I'm asking because yeah. I don't know the answer to either of the records. <laughs> <laughs> I think he did the Pixies record. I could be wrong, but I think that's one of his yeah. signatures. Yeah, well, I mean, I do. I would say that is, uh, I mean, Steve Albini's sound is, uh, is kind of, I'm kind of changing my answer halfway through. But I would also say my favorite drum sound in general right now is the Wilson, Pick uh, Wilson Pickett, uh, Land of a Thousand mm -hmm. Dances. Um, oh, yeah. which again is Roger Hawkins on the drums. And I'm assuming it's just a super compressed mono overhead kick drum mic, and then just whatever bleed from the room. Uh, but yeah, similar snare drum right. sounds, you know, kind of open, cracky. So last question, I'm getting everybody's input. I'm rebuilding this similar to your first drum. This isn't my first drum, but it's like a, a near cousin of my first drum. It's gig percussion, <laughs> and it, it says gig percussion Japan. So I can only assume it's a Pearl factory drum before they were Pearl or whatever. Rusty as hell. Hoops, triple flam hoops, but they're super rusty. It's got the terrible screwdriver screws everywhere. Holes for an for internal muffler. It doesn't exist. A throw-off that is grinding into the top hoop. Still works, though. Um, <laughs> I want to rebuild this thing because here at uh, Drum Factor Direct, I have access to everything. I've got mm -hmm. all the lugs you can imagine, all the different hoops, die cast, triple flange, single flange, double flange, wood hoops, 3.0s, solid brass, all the heads you can imagine, all the different types of snare wires you can imagine. I want to make this thing not a piece of hoop. So if I handed you this drum, it's, uh, let's call it the tetanus, the tetanus snare drum. Okay. What would you do? to it what would you start with um i would get i like super sensitive snare wires so i would get like a 40 strand uh just because okay. I, I love that sound that's the first thing i would get on that um okay i was I, I'm, I'm curious though so the aquarian so i've 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 seen that on a few heads so they have that like mm -hmm. reinforcement of where the actual snare wires are, yeah, this are touching is the, the drum 
This is the high performance snare side, which has, it's not on the top, it's on the bottom. So it's like white tape. It's like white tape, like pre, pre-placed. It's supposed to, like if one of these wires would snap and you get that sharp edge, mm-hmm. it's supposed to keep it from just tearing the head apart. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. These are these were just miscellaneous things because I got this drum from a buddy of mine in, in Albany. Shout out to Bernie Shalin. He just sent it to me. He's like, I paid like twenty bucks for this. It didn't have any heads or anything. Mm-hmm. So I just put whatever I had at, at my office at the time. So I've got like Pure Sound Metrics wires. No idea. Um, Aquarian eh, high performance snare side, texture coated top, a little bit of Stuart Copeland style tape. Sure, sure. It actually records pretty well, so I'm kind of afraid that I'm going to rebuild it and hate it. But <laughs> I got to try. I haven't touched it. I think it has all and all the all the tension rods are splaying, like they're. It's just in really bad shape. <laughs> well, if you have access to every lug, I would I would yeah. see if if it wouldn't if it wouldn't mess up the shell because obviously there's pre pre drilled holes. I would try and ju- just for fun because it's already like this is just drums just gonna you, with the story of you rebuilding it you just want to look at it and smile at that point it's I mean you're still yeah. gonna use your other drums at you know at during clutch performances so I would just say get one of every possible lug you can get the beaver tail <laughs> get the what, what's it called the battleship get the imperial <laughs> oh know, we've just got get, weird spiky ones that'll like kill you <laughs> dude and ma- make sure they're different colors so every every little lug it's like a 10 lug snare just get 10 different lugs on that Ew. thing have fun all right well you're gonna you ask for it i'm gonna do it and you're gonna <laughs> see it and i might i might send it to you if it ends up being the, the fan favorite version <laughs> i'll put a big foam thing on it and i'll i'll, I'll compare it to my 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 ruther <laughs> crazy all right. Well, that's it. That's all you would do. You would just jack it up with some weird hoop and uh, lugs. <laughs> Let's see what what uh, and big snares. You said big snares too. Big big snare wires. Um, I'd probably put a uh, a, a a trick um, throw off on mm-hmm. there because I if I if I hate having snares that don't have those on there. Um, they're just so smooth. And uh, this is garbage too. By the way. <laughs> It still works, but yeah, it's garbage. Can you can you put it up? I want to see like a little. What do you? What do you want to see? Yeah, there you go. Just the throw off. It's it's just got the you know the um, the Ludwig knockoff. The, in it. is it the P eighty seven? Is that what they call it? I guess it's like just one of those knock. It works, but I would never take it to a gig. I know like one song in, it's going to just explode and fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> um, now the cool thing is they drilled the throw off so close to the top of the shell that the head actually smashes into it. Okay. So you can only tighten it that far. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, do, do, do you have a stick? Can, can, can you hit it? I'm, I'm curious how it might yeah. with there. I mean, that sounds pretty good, dude. It's got five pieces of tape on it. And it still sounds like that. I have used this on sessions. It was something that needed to sound like Stuart Copeland. And this, for whatever reason, was the one. But I haven't touched it in like five years. So it needs I, a, it I needs would also, if I, if I was investing in this, I would get rid of that gig percussion, uh, you know, badge. And I would have Scott from uh, Tackle Instruments <laughs> make some like really cool thing. rustic thing that says, you know, Mike Dawson, you know, perk. And I would, uh. I would, I would emblazon that on there. He probably only charge you three, you know, three thousand dollars. So it's good investment. <laughs> Thirty dollar drum. Put about yeah. five hundred dollars into it. Still sounds like crap. <laughs> well, that's my mo. You got the Nicky Moon symbol next to you, so at least you're in. You know, Dude, you, you got that to make head. up for it. Well, I can't thank you enough. I have to thank you for getting me back into podcasting. I was all set to retire and never, never get back on this Zoom H two ever again. But you brought me back, so here Dude, we are. I'm so, happy to, man. We should talk a little bit about the network and the whole vibe. So you approached me, it's been a while, about forming <laughs> yeah. a podcast network. You were the first person which, we approached, by the way, when we were talking about it. We, uh, yeah, you were the first name that popped in our head, so. Yeah, and I'm the last one to actually get a show out. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, that's why we approached you first, because we're like, well, we got to get him rolling, and then we'll go to the easy people. Um, no, yeah, so the podcast... Um, yeah, I'm curious when you release this, if it's out yet, but regardless, it's called The Drum Click. 
which is a name that Chris, the owner of Big Fat Snare Drum, has had for a while of just this random business idea. Didn't know what he wanted to do with it, but it's called The Drum Click, and it's a podcast network, the world's first drumming podcast network. And essentially, as of right now, it's it's uh, my podcast, Big Fat Five, which is basically me uh, bringing on my favorite drummers, having them talk about their the top five influences uh, in their life because every drummer has a different story and how they approach the instrument. So it's not so much gear focus. It's more of just like, you know, influences. So we have, we have that and then we have you. And which is, mm-hmm. uh, what's the name of this one again? Is it Drum Candy? We are Drum Candy, brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. Love Thank it, you. love it. <laughs> Mine's financially <laughs> supported by Big Fat Snare Drum. And it, was like, it sounded like PBSE, so I thought it was funny. Um, so we have those two, and then we have uh, Sarah Hagen backstage, which Sarah yep. was um, Zildjian uh, Artist Relations Worldwide head for a long time, and now she's uh, running her own consulting business um, she's just an every woman. She's doing so much in the industry these days, but her podcast called Sarah, uh, Sarah Hagen backstage is more conversational. And, uh, she, again, with being the, the Zildjian a rep, she has developed amazing close relationships with everyone's favorite drummers. And so mm-hmm. she can pull a lot of cool, uh, fun stories that normal podcast hosts, uh, can't pull out of people. <laughs> and, uh, and then we have drum history, which is one of my favorite podcasts. Um, it's Bart Vanderzee and he just uh, invites uh, people that are experts on a certain facet of the drum industry, uh, companies, or just, um, you know, little niches of the industry and has them talk about the history. And so it's, it's really, it's a really great podcast. And so the network was kind of, it scratched every little part of everyone's drummer brain and mm-hmm. it's essentially just a landing page for, hey, if you don't know where to search for podcasts, because there's so many podcasts, let alone drumming podcasts out there, we're like, hey, this is you know a good starting point. And then our plan is to add more and more podcasts and just have people be it easier to find really good shows uh, that are very, very varied. So very varied. Well, <laughs> Everyone, please, if you don't already, subscribe to Big Fat Five and the rest of the shows on the network. And what is the name of the EP? Uh, it's called Grim Value. Go check out the EP. Is the live stream available now, or is it gone for eternity? It's the, uh, the current one, I think, was only up for the weekend. But uh, we're probably going to piss everyone off that paid for the ticket and release it on YouTube eventually. So, you know, it's an right. RMO. So just just wait. You don't have to <laughs> just, buy anything. Just don't wait. purchase anything. Just wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, Ben. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for in- inviting me to doing the network. I'm course, sure man. you'll be back on this show very often, and we'll uh, see you soon. Sweet, dude. All right. It's time for day two of our snare drum makeover. Last week, Mike Johnston had suggested that we use diecast tubes. We install an internal muffler. Now, here's what the issue. I was trying to install the internal muffler. And since knowing this drum was probably made by Pearl, I got a Pearl internal muffler that we had at the warehouse and also one of our in-house DFD internal mufflers. They're, they have the round felt with the twist knob. The problem with them is the, the holes in the shell are just too wide for these, just, I don't know, eighth of an inch too wide for both of these mufflers. So there's nothing that I could do to make them fit. Um, And then, like a dummy, I forgot to bring a socket wrench, so once I had one of them installed, the locking nut, I couldn't remove it. So uh, I had to just kind of twist the muffler and let it float inside the shell for the rest of this (laughs) segment. So I'm definitely going to get that sussed out for next week so we can do a proper uh, internal muffler test. Um, and then, you know, I've also realized with these old drums, they've been around and sometimes once you start moving pieces, things start to fall apart. I had two swivel nuts. One of them was just spinning in the casing and the other one is stripped. So I had to, you know, kind of finagle a little bit to get this drum to tune back up. Um, I'm going to have to replace those swivel nuts to get this drum fully operational. So again, once you start pulling, it's like an onion, you start peeling the onion, you see you know, all the rotten stuff inside, unfortunately. But I was able to get, you know, the new head, the, the heads back on, the die cast hoops installed, tuned up pretty good, surprisingly, even with the two swivel nuts that were giving me issues. I was able to get a longer tension ride that fit in the one, and then 
the one that was you know just spinning a inside the lug i just used a, a different tensure rod and it just fit a little bit better again not a perfect solution that has to be addressed but you know then i got the wires back on um again using cord to affix snare wires not my favorite choice i'm gonna i'm gonna replace the throw off before the end of the season um so anyway that's that's where we left it and then i just tuned it up um, to my normal kind of medium high starting point which is the you know tension rod pitch of d on the top and a g on the bottom so perfect perfect fourth and i just took it to the studio and messed around with it tuned it up a few different ways uh starting at medium high went a couple couple turns higher to see how high it would go and then backed it all the way down super low and then brought it back up a couple things i've i've learned with die cast tubes from this test um definitely makes the drums sound more polished more you know it, it lost some of the mojo funkiness that it had with the original thin hoops when i had the wires really loose and the heads kind of tuned medium low but it, it made it more of a precise more you know definitely a thicker more contemporary sound so i think what i lost in maybe vibe i gained in professionalism um just more presence more snap definitely more power wanted to be hit louder wanted to be tuned higher surprisingly so um, um i'm pretty shocked at what just a set of die cast hoops can do to a drum so we're going to revisit this um, on some other drums in next season later later down the road we really do a bunch of comparisons with hoops but so here we go here is the gig steel snare to medium high all the way up super high super low and then back up to where i think it felt best which to my ears, it sounded best tuned a little bit higher than where I started.
for listening. I'll see you next week. 